as we continue in Mark, open up to Mark chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. And this is a very abbreviated account of the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness by Satan. And we see in Matthew 4 and Luke 4, much more extended descriptions of what went on. And so I want to parallel those with this passage. So let's read verses 12 and 13 of Mark 1. Immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness, and he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. Let's open in prayer. Father, thank you so much that Jesus was tempted in every way as we were, yet without sin, and that he is a fit sacrifice for us. Just pray that we might know him more because of this study, and Lord, just bless this time. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we've gone through the first 11 verses of Mark, and now we're at 12 and 13. This is a very condensed version of the temptation. Yet again, Mark uh, describes this very briefly. Mark's a very abrupt type of guy. You see he uses the word immediately or suddenly so many times throughout this book. And so Jesus does this, and then immediately he did this, and then, then he did this, and then, then he does. Very to the point. And so Mark is a very different style from, say, Luke, who's very ornate in his Greek and... He's a historian and a doctor, so he's very intelligent in the language, and that was his trade. So he did a very good job for Theophilus when he wrote that for him. But here we have Mark, who's just very rudimentary and just like, this is what happened, this, 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 this happened. Okay, so just a very basic account of what Jesus did. Some common themes occur in this temptation, and I want to take these mainly from Matthew 4 and Luke 4, and it's described in this theme. 1 John 2, verse 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And so you see these three things, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, all common in the temptation. And I want to also parallel this with the temptation in Eden, where in Genesis 3, were these present? Well, yes, the lust of the flesh, it would be tasty, this fruit of the tree. And it doesn't say it's an apple, but it's a fruit of the tree. And God commanded us not to take it, but yeah, we chose to. We still do. We choose that apple that he tells us not to do in sin. But it would be tasty, the lust of the flesh. The lust of the eyes, it's good looking. It's good to taste. Uh, and it's good to sight. So it's good looking. And then you have those two. And then the pride of life. You'll be wise, knowing good and evil like God. You'll be like God. And so the pride of life, you're going to exalt yourself to new status. This will put you on a whole other level. So Satan tempted Eve and Adam. Adam was there with her. And so we're without excuse. And so interesting there too, Romans 5, 12. Sin entered the world with one man, and then thus it has appeared upon all men. And so we're stained by sin. But we have this pattern here, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And here with the temptation in the wilderness, the same thing, the lust of the flesh. Jesus, after 40 days, was really hungry. This was him at his weakest. And so Satan, as a prowling lion, who does he try to take down? It's those who are weak, those who are alone, those who can fall. And so we see Jesus in his humanity at his weakest point, and yet he undergoes temptation and, and overcomes. He conquers it. And may we rely on his strength to conquer any temptation in our lives as well. But we have the lust of the flesh. So he was really hungry. Satan says, turn these stones into bread. And ultimately saying, violate the fast, which is always a commitment to God the Father. And Jesus did not do that. And instead, he answered with a word from Scripture. He said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And so he's quoting the Old Testament, the law, and Scripture, very much so Jesus knew the word. We also see the lust of the eyes, where Satan tempts Jesus and says, If you bow and worship me, I can give you all these kingdoms, and all these expanse of the kingdoms. And Satan is called the ruler of this world, as well as the prince and the, uh, of the power of the air. In Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2. And so we have a fallen world in which we still undergo temptation and Satan's dealings. Heaven will be a place where we don't have to worry about that, but we're not there yet, and so we still do undergo temptation. We're going under these trying grounds, so may we be found faithful. So what Satan was saying is, commit idolatry. And Jesus responds, he says, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You will worship the Lord your God, and him only will you serve. And so he knew the word yet again. And he overcomes that temptation. And then Satan also said, with the pride of life, cast yourself down, son of God. The angels will catch you. And so literally, because you're the son of God, you can do this. And essentially tempt God, which the word also says don't do. And Jesus says, 
it is written again, you will not tempt the Lord your God. After all these temptations, Satan left and the angels ministered to the Lord. It's interesting, sometimes after you go through a battle, you're exhausted. And Jesus, after 40 days of fasting, was exhausted. We see here, he was very human, and yet he overcame temptation. He was tempted in every way as we were, yet without sin. And so Jesus was our example to follow, as well as our perfect sacrifice, our sinless lamb sacrifice. And praise God for that. If he sinned, if he, under, if he <laughs> succumbed to this temptation and, and failed, then we would be all men most miserable and without hope in this world. And Jesus, if he sinned, then he's not a legit sacrifice for us. And he wouldn't be the second Adam, but thankfully he was. Jesus' response, again, it was always a, a word from Scripture. He was the Word, made flesh, but he knew the Word, which was important. We need to know the Word. Psalm 119.11 says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And we need to hide God's word in our heart. We need to memorize it, learn it. Learn what it says especially. You don't have to know the exact reference. Some of my friends have problems with the references, but they know what it says. And to know what the Bible says. Like Billy Graham would always preach, the Bible says this. And so regardless of whether you know the numbers or not, it's always helpful for me because I can look it up. And I'm kind of a numbers guy anyway. But just know what God's word says. So when Satan twists scripture even so basically and simply and minutely, we can know even those basic and simple and minute differences because we know what God's word says and we know what he stands for. Satan, again, as a serpent, he twists scripture sneakily so as to plant seeds of doubt in our hearts. And we have to recognize his work, pray for the Lord's protection as we go about this difficult road. Lies are everywhere. We're supposed to discern. And again, we need to take every thought captive because our lives are battlegrounds. Satan wants to distract us from God. God wants us to know him and love him. God wants the best for us. God wants to bless us. But the thief is out to steal, kill, and destroy. And if you've been buying lies about God and, and thinking he's not merciful and not loving, you need to reevaluate because that's a lie from the enemy. And I just want to expose that in Jesus' name. And I just pray for freedom for you in Jesus' name, that any attack of the enemy would just fall short, that no weapon formed against you will prosper. That's from Isaiah 54. It's very true. And yet yeah, we're, we're just in this big battle. We need to arm ourselves. We need to put on the full armor of God, and, as in Ephesians 6, and really be faithful as we go about this battle, because this life is a battle. And may God give you strength through the battle. And really, just as Jesus underwent temptation and overcame, you can overcome through Jesus and through his power. And so be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might, Ephesians 6.10. Another admonition from that Armor of God passage. So I pray that over your life, and let's close in prayer. And next segment, yeah, we'll be dealing with other parts of Mark. So God bless you, and let's pray. Father, thank you so much for being faithful, being a faithful God, and remaining faithful in our lives. We come against any lie of the enemy in Jesus' name, and Lord, rebuke the enemy over the lives of these people in Jesus' name. Bless those who are watching and be their stronghold and their refuge in times of trouble. We thank you so much, Lord, for coming to destroy the works of the devil. And Lord God, we just pray for just a resolve for us to be determined to stand firm, to stand, to remain, and to really be a blessing to you as you've been a blessing to us. But God, we know it's only through your power that we can overcome, and yet we have access to it. So God, I just pray a blessing over everyone who's watching and just give them real strength from your kingdom and bless them as they go through this life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, till next segment. God bless you.